uh, homework. So the homework, I'm going to, there's two questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> basically they're both, okay. They're both Schumpeterian models. Um, the Schumpeterian models are a little bit, the, the, the fact is that first model I did, the, the Romer model with the, um, a general elasticity where you're adding new products, it, it's, it's pretty good. It is kind of annoying because you have so many elasticities jumping around and like, there's just like a lot going on. Uh, Schumpeterian model is actually simpler. Um, because you get, uh, the last thing we derived at the end of the last time was that your profits are basically a function of your technological lead. Okay. And we'll, we'll go back to that in a second. Uh, it's actually much simpler because then profits are, 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 um, well, they're the same basically across, across product lines. Okay. Um, and if, if your if your step size is always Lambda, they're the same. Okay. In more complicated models, you have a random step size, in which case they'd be different. But if you have a fixed step size, you're just going along. That's that's the size of innovation. Your profits are going to be the same because you're you're just moving up that quality ladder. Okay. Um, okay. So and we're going to finish that today. Okay. So you'll know everything you, basically you need to almost everything you need to know for the homework today, and then there'll be just the social planner stuff, which isn't really super relevant for most of this. Um, we'll do next time. Okay. So, uh, but this is going to be basically they're two very similar models. Um, the first one, the tweak I'm adding here is this little alpha, which is just like a little weight that adds some heterogeneity across product lines. There's just some product lines are just like kind of more important than others. You know, there's some products are, are just more critical to your, uh, life than others. Okay. And that's reflected in this alpha thing. And then the question is, does that make, you know, do, does that change how innovation works? Um, that's one. Okay. Just kind of just go through solve the equilibrium. You actually have to do some in sort of integrals. Okay. Uh, ah, shoot. Okay. I'm going to change this. The second one should not have the alpha because that, I just copied it and forgot to erase the alpha. The second one should have a regular production function, which I'm going to, I'll right after class, I'll go and, and add that, but just to, so it should just be a regular production function. Okay. But what's going to change here is that instead of having infinite length patents, Hi, have, Henry, uh, yeah. I guess we, we cannot see is quite clear. The resolution uh, is it, does it get less, is this readable? Yeah. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so basically this, this alpha should not be there. I, I'll, I'll take care of that in a second. Okay. And then, um, basically, so, so this is a pretty standard, what we're basically what we're going to be doing today. Uh, but, it, but instead of having infinite length patents, okay. Where basically with, with infinite length patents, you still get booted out. Okay. Um, but you get booted out by a competitor. Okay. With finite length patents, you, you either get booted up, booted out by a competitor or like a new innovator or, uh, your patent expires and you, you, and you revert to competitive production. So anyone can use your technology, which means that you're, you enter into a Bertrand situation with, well, not, not even two with, with just tons and tons of potential, uh, competitors. Okay. So, um, in which case you would expect zero profits and, and, and efficient levels of production. Okay. So the monopoly goes away basically. Okay. So that's going to be the dynamic and, and essentially what I'm going to do is here is solve that. You're going to have to figure out what, you know, at for given innovation rates and, and patent uh, expiration rates, what's the fraction of products at a given time that are patented versus unpatented. Okay. And then that'll help you solve the equilibrium. Okay. Um, and then at the end, I ask you about the social planner, how to think about the social planner. Um, well, we're going to do a social planner next time. So, I mean, it, it's similar to, to the Roman model, but, uh, you'll, that, that last part for part question two, you may need, you know, it's going to be helpful to, to what we will likely be have to be doing next class in the social planner. Okay. So, uh, but Hey, maybe we'll, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit today. Okay. So that's, um, so that's the problem set. Okay. So then, um, I mean, I'm just going to sides here just so I get to uh actually I'll, I'll just go back to here. okay so um <clears throat> and uh that's gonna be due next Thursday so like a week plus two days basically okay because I mean the, the finals coming out that I don't wanna um push things back too far. I mean you you you're gonna be studying for other finals and in, in, in this final so um you know uh I, I don't the questions are not too expansive and because they're both Trumpetarian they don't you're not, well, there's some algebra, but it's not going to be really like a ton of algebra. Okay. So, um, it should be relatively. Okay. Um, all right. So that's one thing. And then, um, the last thing is, uh, we have 
these OMET uh, uh, evaluations. Okay, so I would fill those out. Always curious to know what you guys think. Um, some good feedback. Um, and yeah, so I, I know that it's 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 not mandatory, right? So, but it uh, it is always good to 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 you know get get that feedback. Um, so I can kind of adjust things going forward. You're you're contributing to a public good, which is hopefully improving my teaching or, or tweaking my teaching for future generations. Okay, and you'll know the future generations. So you know it's uh, you don't know them yet. So I guess. So can you, but you will know them, so maybe that will do some, some something like more altruism. I don't know. Okay, you'd have to ask behavioral stuff that one. Okay, so um, all right. So then, uh, yeah, I, I think those. I forget when those are due, but they're. I think they're out now, so you can, you can just do that anytime. Um, for the undergrads, I do it in class, but I'm not gonna. I, I trust that you guys. You're 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 slightly older than undergrads now. You're 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 moved on to the next stage, so uh, I think you can handle this. Um, okay, so uh, let's then jump into doing stuff with models, specifically endogenous growth models, okay? Um, so uh, yeah, so last time, this is where we ended up last time. Let me just just, just show you a bunch of equations here. Uh, basically last time the, 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 the kicker that we found, although I think I, I think I kind of fast forward ahead a little bit was this profit function, okay? Um, so let me let me just step back one or two steps and then and then show you why that that profit function arises. Okay, so but essentially <clears throat> the the main result that we got last time on the production side was this limit pricing result. Okay, so essentially um, the you know it, the, remember that production function. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of like sort of awkwardly exist on the bottom of this page for now because I want to use some of this stuff. Okay, so the production function, uh, you know, remember was yi is equal to qi times li. So qi is your productivity. That's good chunking up over time. That's the, what's called the quality ladder dynamic where you just, you, every innovation improves it by some uh, multiplicative factor lambda. Uh, and then over time that leads to, to growth overall because it's happening across all the different product lines. Okay. Um, and we'll see what that growth rate is uh, later on. Okay. so. Um, so that's that's QI, okay, and then you're producing things with labor. So then that means your marginal cost for a given you know product line firm I and a given QI, uh, it's gonna be you have to pay that labor wage W, and then to produce one unit, you need to use one over Q uh, of those um, workers, okay. So to produce one unit of uh, output of YI, you need to pay W over QI. So that's your marginal cost in terms of money. Okay, in terms of labor, it's one over QI. In terms of money, you just add a wage on there to get W over QI. All right, um, that's for the, what, and so in general, QI is going to be the QI, the productivity of the leader, okay? And then um, we can also talk about the follower who's gonna have QI of Orlando. So this was the incumbent previously, but then they got this, they're going to get displaced or they are getting displaced in this process, okay? But they had some, you know, they're, they're just lambda behind the leader, okay? Or in other words, the leader is lambda ahead of them, okay? And that means that their marginal cost, MC minus I, is going to be, well, it's going to be W over Q minus I, which is going to be lambda W over QI, if you will. All right. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's, that's going to be their marginal cost, okay? Um, now, the, the, the insight with limit pricing is that you can, if you're the leader, you can you can effectively preclude the the follower from wanting to enter by setting your price equal to their marginal cost. Okay, they just have there's no reason they would ever want to enter if you do that. By producing, they only make they, they just dig their prop, negative profit hole deeper. Okay, so they can produce zero and just which is effectively not entering the market. Okay, um, so that so that that's why up top I'll just rewrite it here. But we have li the, a limit pricing strategy. So here it's P for for from I. Superscript L means the limit pricing strategy, okay, is going to be setting it to MC minus I, which we just saw as lambda W QI. Okay, so that's what they're going to do. You can go through and now I, I didn't give this the 100% formal treatment because what you really want to show is, um, uh, you know, in general, it is possible to have both firms producing, okay? That could happen. Um, 
we're saying that that the equilibrium is that that does not happen. Okay, so so if both terms are producing, you you know you get some y i and you get some y minus i that gets combined into the total production and and sent to the the inverse demand function, which determines the market price. I mean the the, the price paid by the the final good producer. Okay, so you just the you just add together what's produced by both firms, and that will determine a price, and you can get profits and everything like that. What we're saying is that um, <clears throat> if I, as the leader, uh, produce, you know, I said, so I, I said that's price PI, which means I produce a, a kind of commitment about, y, about YI, which I'll show in a second. Um, the the follower can then, can then, if they produce zero, they'll get zero, naturally. And then if they produce anything positive, they'll start getting negative profits. Okay. In which case it's, it's a, uh, optimal for them to produce zero. Okay. Um, there, there's still show, you still have to show that, um, in, in, in the, in the most like sort of formal sense, you would still want to show that, uh, well, let's see, um, that there are no other price. So there, there are no other prices that the leader can set that are better. Okay. So we know that if the, the leader sets, um, the limit price, okay, they're going to get a certain amount of profit, which we'll see is positive. Okay. Um, if they go, if they set a lower price, okay, the follower is still not going to want to enter, right? That's even worse for them. Uh, they set a higher price. Well, the follower may want to enter now, but th that's sort of Stackelberg logic. Okay. Uh, Nash equilibrium logic though, it's good enough. You know, the follower is not entering. And so then, um, the question is, you know, what what is that uh, leader doing? Okay, and they're they're happy producing at that. Amount. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, so it, you know, if you, if you really go through, you have to you have to sign some derivatives. Okay, but but basically, I'm gonna argue that this is this is there, and, and you, I've done it in the past uh, years. It's it's not very satisfying, um, but basically, you can you know intuitively you can you can see that they can just ensure that they're monopolists by setting this appropriate price. Okay. And when you go to general epsilon, this is for epsilon equals one, remember? And, and with that, in particular, epsilon equals one. Where is this occurring? Can you see that? You can see that, right? Um, it's like blocked by other zoom stuff. Epsilon equals one is, or maybe it's the lag, okay. Oh, it's the lag, that's why you can't see it. Um, epsilon equals one will give you a particular demand function which is not showing up on my computer. Let me uh, let me reconnect this thing real quick. Sorry. Uh, it'll give you a particular demand function, which is just that that y basically y is going to y i times p i is going to be equal to y. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, let me just do like a proper restart here. The iPad is not happy. In the meantime, yep. since Lambda is a technology kind of dump that you get from your investment mm -hmm. uh is lambda greater than one or is it greater than yeah. zero lambda is okay. greater than one so actually yeah and i so do we get a like a i don't yeah i just because like if it happens in jumps do you end up getting like a lambda squared or like a one plus lambda times like a one plus two you know what i'm saying like, so yeah so the basically okay the, the ipad is back okay so let me let me draw a picture so so you're gonna the quality light is going to look so you got you some i don't know q zero or whatever i mean they're like okay now it's not it was back for a second so you're i mean i'll just mix my words okay so you're going to get some initial at some time you're going to have some initial value um and then every lambda increments it by and lambda greater than one increments it by some factor we're getting like a super slow animation here uh we'll increment it by some factor so you got lambda and then lambda squared the next innovator and then lambda q okay in yeah. in absolute terms. Now, the good thing is that we never have to worry about is it are we, you know, are we at the hundredth step, in which case it's lambda to the hundred. Because all we ever need to know is that the, the previous step is a lambda proportionately lambda back. That'll tell us right. our profits. 
that'll tell us our labor. It'll tell us everything basically. And so that, and that's the, uh, the sort of memory, memorylessness or something like that, um, where we don't have to worry about the whole history. We just have to worry about what was the previous step. Which is, and, and, and that, so I mean, we can, yeah. we can just, you know, it, it, we're going to assume generally that somebody is always only one step behind that we never jump more than one step ahead of the next person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So every innovation is just one step. Um, so um, with, with, yeah, so, so then, <clears throat> you know, you, you can, you can generalize it to a situation where you have a, a random outcome. So you do innovation and uh, there's some, this is, okay, I'm going to wait for that figures itself out there's some you do innovation and there's some <clears throat> uh realization of a random variable a, la a random lambda that's say greater than one but but you don't know by how much um and then that'll give you a slightly different dynamic uh, you, you still only need to, need to know what was the value of that lambda to figure out what your profits are uh but it will induce sort of ex post heterogeneity in um in this okay so um <clears throat> it's really it's not happy guys uh let me, let me look in. Oh, okay. I think I figured it out. Okay. Hopefully that, okay. This was what I, yeah. So this is what I was going to draw before. Basically, you, know, you have lambda and you usually you can think about if, if you do need to think about, you know, what, what is, um, Q, this is like some QI, you, usually you can assume it starts at one. It's kind of without, without lots of generality, but, but this quality ladder notion here is just that is this. Okay. And yeah, lambda is greater than one. So then, um, yeah, and, and actually in the notes, um, in the, the long form notes, which I've been sort of turning into slides and I, I'm mostly done, um, I had lambda, sometimes people do it with lambda as a zero based thing, when, in which case you'd end up with one plus lambda. The one plus lambda. Yeah. Okay. So if you were looking at those before last night, <laughs> yeah, then there were some, it was sort of zero indexed, but then I, I started you. doing it in slides. So, so I, okay. I made that all consistent. Now it's all one index. So you'll get basically just lambdas. The purpose of, of this semester, lambda is lambda's greater than one, and there's yeah. no yeah. Zero. Last semester we might have had zero, but then you you know it's it's just you, then you have to write one plus lambda. It's it doesn't make lambda. much difference. It was just yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it made a difference in like the the marginal costs that come out and stuff. And I just wondered yeah. if that was a lag. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Doug. Okay. Yep. Um. Okay. So then. Uh. All right. So this. Let's see. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to do go back because it'll induce an animation, which is apparently catastrophic. But um, <clears throat> so, we, so we had like you know, lambda W over QI, right? That was our limit pricing strategy. Okay. And that epsilon equals one in this case. So it implies, um, you know, uh, for the inverse demand function, for instance, this basically. Remember in general, it was Y over YI to the epsilon power. Okay. Uh, but epsilon is equal to one, and so we get this, all right? And and the funny thing about this is that it means that your revenue, pi, yi, is equal to y, which is not a function of your price, okay? So no matter what price you set, you get the same revenue, okay? And so that's why you want to set a very high price, which you can see here will lead to very low production levels. If you just invert this into a demand function, which means very low cost levels. Right, so you effectively have zero cost because you just produced one super valuable instance of that the product. Um, if if you were unconstrained uh, and get y as your profit, okay, but you are constrained because you've got your your, your nearest competitor lambda away lurking, okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so this this is our pi. This is what we're going to choose, okay. And then we're just mapping. It. So what does that imply about yi? What does that imply about li? about profits and all of that. Okay, so just mapping through these various functions. So for yi, right, so yi is y over pi. Okay, so it's y times one over pi, which is qi over lambda w. Okay. Um, not much, I mean, uh, not too much to be said about that, uh, but if you think about what's happening to yi over time, Okay, uh, you know, so, so Y is growing over time. Y is total output. W is growing because workers are being compensated for higher productivity through the, through Q. Some at, so W is going to reflect sort of aggregate productivity. Um, and then QI itself is going up. So y, essentially Y and W are going to kind of balance out and then QI is going to grow. So, so each individual QI is driving growth in YI. Okay, uh, we don't have to worry about 
exactly why I ate too much. Or it, it, yeah, so it's so because um, there's no units. Okay, it's it's not clear what it doesn't map into anything that we could talk about in the real world. So it's useful to solve the model, of course, but it's not going to be something we're going to look at as an outcome. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we can look at other stuff. Okay, so we can look at li, for instance. That's a little bit easier to to map the data. Okay, so li is going to be yi over qi, right? That's our that's the inverse basically of our production function and so that's going to be y over lambda w. okay so that so here already we get um uh the constancy of labor across product lines okay so we're going to use the same amount of labor because we have the same lambda in every product line okay we're going to use the same amount of labor if we had different lambdas then of course we would we would have some differences in labor but with the same lenses, we, we get we get another symmetric labor outcome. Okay. Um all right, and then uh yeah, and then also you can you can multiply by w and say w l i is equal to y, you know, y over lambda. Okay. So um so this this gets two things. Well, for one, this is your cost. Okay, it's, it's not showing up yet. This is annoying. Uh Okay, so yeah, but if you if you look at that last line, if you, if you think about W times Li, that's going to be Y over lambda, right? It's going to hopefully show up in a second. Um, and that there's two things with that one. Okay, so that's your cost as the intermediate producer. Okay, which is we're going to use that in a second. Um, and then the other thing is that that's also the that also tells you about the labor share. Okay, in particular, if you think about what uh, WLI over Y is going to be one over lambda. So that labor you know the the share of going to production labor okay is going to be one over lambda all right um and then the, then you're gonna have a profit share that we'll see in a minute too which is going to be one minus one over lambda okay so um seems like we've given up the ghost again here uh let me think about this Let me, let me try one thing here. I have uh, two wireless networks in my house for reasons. Um, and I want to make sure the iPad's on the same one as my computer. All right, give me a second here. Um, come on. Have you tried giving it a yaw? I haven't tried it yet. Yaw! Um, <laughs> yaw, iPad, yaw. Um, I think we're making progress. Are we? Maybe. Yeah. Not. Spiritually, yes. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, where is everything? I'm getting confused. Uh, no, I have to shut up here. Okay, so like it seems the iPad thinks it's connected. That's a step, but it's not actually connected. Uh, or it's not actually showing me anything, which is somewhat problematic. Uh, let me try. Let me just try one more quick restart here and then that doesn't work i can always go to the slides and just talk through them okay it's a little suboptimal i think but um we can always do that all right yeah i i i i, I attempted once again to uh to get sounds like a soundboard thing working but it, it wasn't it wasn't doing it uh and again i didn't want to you know cause irreparable harm to my streaming setup um okay so let's see if this works all right i'm gonna try and write stuff so so okay so far so good um i think it might have been the wi-fi issue uh so yeah so this means that the late sort of the well the labor the labor share going to that one product okay is going to be um uh one over lambda okay but then if you integrate that all right over all product lines since there's a unit mass of product lines and it's a linear thing, okay, that also means that WP 
over y is going to be 1 over lambda as well. Okay, because p is p is is just the integral of li. Okay, so you see, because it's um, linear, you can just integrate it, and you're going to get that labor share. The production labor share, I should say, is uh, is 1 over lambda. Okay, and it just means that if if uh, if lambda is large, the firms don't have much, much uh, or they, they have a lot of monopoly power. And if they have a lot of monopoly power, they get a lot of profits, which has to come from somewhere. And in this case, it comes from production workers. Okay. So, um, all right. So that's one thing. All right. And that, uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Let me, let me get to the profits and then, and then we'll move on to the aggregate. Okay. So, so, so what can we infer from this? Okay. We can, we can get profits basically now because we have costs W L I is y over lambda, okay? We know that revenues are just y, okay? And, and profit is just the difference between those two things, right? So profit is pi yi minus wli, okay? And so up, just up above, we know that the first, the revenue term is y, wli we found is y over, L, y over lambda. Okay, so then that's one minus, uh, you know, lambda inverse times y, that's pi i, also constant across product lines, okay? So that's your profit, all right? That's what you can expect to get. And as as the technological lead goes to infinity, your profits go to, to y, which is the most you can get, okay? Um, and remember the profits, there's only one, there's a unit mass of firms here. Remember, so if you integrate that pi thing into total profits, you get, the same thing back. Okay, so it's um before there were n firm there were n firms, so you, you have multiplied by n. Here n is one. Okay, so you just integrate stuff and it just turns into a capital letter without the i. Okay, so um so that that's also your your profit share. Okay, uh one minus basically or y minus uh but but the profit share is one minus one over lambda. Okay, so pi over y. All right. Um okay, and then as if you're if you're Cost uh, advantage is, is nothing, which is to say lambda equals one. Okay, then you get one minus one over one, which is zero. Okay, so if your cost advantage is nil, you get zero profits. Okay, so um, all right, so so that's the profit situation. Okay, and the 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 end game is we're going to turn that into a value, uh, and then we're going to plug that value into free entry condition and solve. Okay, it's actually going to be a little bit simpler than than previously, but First, there are some kind of loose ends we need to take care of, okay? But they're not so bad, okay? So I'm gonna keep this stuff here uh, available, okay? So we're, we're, we're just gonna, so, so this is important, clearly, the private level, that's gonna keep, we wanna keep that around. Um, but it, but just for a moment, we wanna say, okay, well, what does all this apply, imply about the aggregate, okay? And we, are, we already actually accidentally did some of that, uh, but but we can we can do some more, okay? so. Essentially, we have these two equations here, yi for yi and li. Okay, and we're going to kind of integrate both of those to the aggregate and see what they imply. Okay, uh, so let, let's do the yi first. Okay, so that says yi is y times q over li times w. So that's a little bit funky. It's like yi depends on y, but then y is just the aggregation of all the y's. So what's the deal? Well, I don't know what the deal is, but we can we can use it. All right. So in particular, you know, so y let's see. Uh yeah, okay, well so you know, y is this. Okay. Y integral from zero to one of, of y of yi. All right. And then um <clears throat> let's see if we can make some headway. So so this is constant returns to scale, this is a production function, okay? So anything that's constant in i, inside yi, I'm gonna try and avoid writing a bunch of algebra to, and say that it's gonna factor it fully outside, right? So so in particular, this y, um, let's see, uh, this y, this lambda, this w, all that stuff is gonna, we can factor that out cleanly to the front of this expression here, okay? And then what we're going to be left with inside is just qi, all right. But but if you want to think about it, it's inside yi, 
it's a multiplicative thing inside a log. So we move it out as log of y plus lambda over w. We move it out of the integral, which is a zero one integral of a thing that doesn't depend on i. So it just factors out. I mean, it'll uh, additively separate out. And then we have the exponential. We can, you know, the log is going to cancel with the exponential and just come out as, as a multiplicative constant. Okay. So, so we're going to end up with, you know, basically um, y over lambda w. Okay. Those constant terms up here that were inside yi. The only thing that's kind of trapped inside is the log of qi. Okay. I guess I should. Well, I guess a function. Um, all right, so the only thing that's trapped inside is log of qi. All right. So, and and I'm going to call that thing. What is it? It's it's kind of like we took the qis and ran them through the production function. Okay. So that's like a, an aggregate aggregate index of productivity. It aggregates all the productivities together in a particular way. It's not the average. It's it's the log log aggregation. It's it's a so sort of a, an even Cobb Douglas sort of aggregation. Okay, um, I'm going to call that just capital Q. All right, which 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 last year was a completely ambient letter choice, um, uh, but but this year is slightly uh, different. But I'm still going to call it Q because I'm not going to change my ways. Um, so uh, so that's what we get y Q over your lambda W. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the, the far left and the far right. The, the y's are going to cancel, okay? And so what we're going to be left with is just uh, with the y's cancel, we get 1 equals q w, okay? So well, what is the thing that we're solving for at this point? Well, I guess we don't really know w, so let's solve for w. So w is going to be q over lambda, all right? So this is saying the wage is reflecting productivity, q, the aggregated productivity, q. Um, and, uh, but then we throw out a factor of lambda, lambda, we also saw effects of the labor share. Um, essentially lambda controls how much profit is going on. So the wage, you know, if there's more profit, there's going to be less wage basically. So that's the slightly modulating. And if we were in a perfectly competitive production environment, which, which essentially be like if lambda were equal to one, okay, that everyone can access these technologies, then you just get W equals Q, which we'll see in a second will make sense. All right. So. Um, yeah, so that's what we got. That's, that's important. I guess I'll say that that's important. Okay. W that would be important if we think about growth rates later on. In particular, it means that W is going to be growing at rate Q. Um, and Q is our main indicator for productivity. The, this aggregation here, uh, sorry, uh, this aggregation of QIs. Okay. All right. So now <clears throat> that was, if we aggregate Y, uh, we can also aggregate L, which we basically already did. So if we take this equation, uh, and integrate this from zero to one, we get capital P equals Y over lambda W. So capital P equal Y over lambda W. Okay. That's what we get when we integrate that equation up above. All right. Um, <clears throat> and actually lambda w is equal to q from this just you look you know up here lambda w is equal to q so that's just y over q and so you can solve that and say well that, that implies that y is equal to p that's q all right very simple outcome all right that the total production is is linear in the amount of production labor you're using okay which is kind of <clears throat> comes from constant returns to scale um, and, and sort of the linearity of intermediate production. Okay. Uh, and then Q again shows up as this overall productivity thing. So, you know, it was not, you know, for, for any given model, the way that you aggregate Q to make like an, an aggregated productivity index, it's not always this, it's something. It usually depends on what the profit, uh, the production function looks like, like in the aggregate, which is exactly like this, right? So it, it's the, the reason I define Q like that is because I, you know, we sort of see that it shows up like that. And it's just notationally simple to define it like that. But we didn't know necessarily beforehand. Uh, but but when you when you have a different aggregator, you're going to end up with a different Q aggregation. And sometimes things are simple. Sometimes they're just very they're you know th in this particular case, things ended up being relatively simple. We got one basic number that defined kind of everything.
that's not always true, but it's often true. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is that if you you could actually derive this last equation y equals p q, um, essentially uh, just starting from this y equation. So if you know, if you plug in for y i, you're going to get log of q i l i d i. Okay, and and as long as you have, and, and what you can do is uh, break it, break that log up. Factor it through the integral, break the exponential up, cancel the exponentials and the logs, and, and you're just going to get basically the aggregation of Q times the aggregation of L. The log log aggregation, aggregation of Q times the log log aggregation of L. Okay, so in, in this case, just to, I'll just write it out, you're going to get the fully factoring this, and this is true in any case, you're going to get something like this. I mean, this, this is because this is a log situation okay so those are those, in any case those will fully factor okay now on top of that well for one we just defined q to be the left hand thing okay that's simple uh on the right we could just define p to be that but in fact since li is constant this is just um equal to that common li value which we know which we kind of Found before. Okay, so so when li is constant, that thing reduces to just whatever li is, which is what we're calling p. Okay, so we don't know what p is yet because that's what we're solving for in the equilibrium. But but there is some p out there. Okay, that's uh, uh, our equilibrium object. You know, together with with r. Okay, so yeah, so that's that's pretty much it in the aggregate. Okay, that tells us kind of what's going on in the aggregate. It also will tell us growth rates. Okay, so whatever q, q i'm going to you know we're basically going to define our new g to be the growth rate of q okay which is gq so we're not going to write gq we'll just write g g is our main index of of it, you know before n was our index of how technology was doing now q is our main index of how technology is doing what's the the, the overall level of productivity Okay, aggregated in a way that's useful for the model, which is, which is like this. Okay, so um, or rather, like this. Okay, so um, so we're gonna when we look at growth rates, if we find the growth rate of Q, that tells us immediately as if we're in a stationary situation where P is not changing. Okay, then that'll tell us the growth rate of Y, and it'll also tell us the growth rate of W in any case. All right, so but Q is 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 the most important thing. Okay, um. <clears throat> All right, so then uh, I think that's all. Yeah, so that that's kind of what we need to know. What we needed to know, uh, and, and from here we're gonna we're gonna turn things into a value. We're gonna turn profits into a value, present value, uh, and then we're gonna plug it into a Fraunhofer condition and go from there. All right, so let's do that. So value function. Okay, so things are slightly more complicated here, okay? And the reason they're more complicated with the values, with the reason they're more complicated <clears throat> is that you can get booted out. Before, <clears throat> in a Romer model, you make your own product and you're there forever. Now, you can, you're can you there until basically a new entrant, come, a new innovator comes along and they boot you out. Okay, so, um, and the uh, let's see. So, so these new innovators that they're well, just what we're gonna say is for now we know they're coming in at some rate tau. We're gonna, this is an equilibrium variable, but just assume there's new innovators coming in at rate tau. So this is the innovation rate. Um, <clears throat> that's we're gonna solve for that, okay? In in equilibrium, okay. But for now, we're just gonna say that they they they're, they're coming in at rate tau. Okay, and essentially they're they're innovating a rate tau. When they're successful, uh, they they just land on a random product line. Okay, they're not targeting things; they just land on a random product line between zero and one. Because there's a, a one unit mass of products, that means the rate, uh, the aggregate rate is tau. The rate at for an individual product is also going to be tau, right? In general, if there were you know 
a mass of 10 product lines, okay, then if the aggregate rate was tau, the individual rate would be tau over 10 because you'd be splitting it over more product lines, okay? But because there's one, then tau, the, the aggregate rate is equal to the individual rate, okay? So that's usually not an issue because we, we set it up so that, you know, we have unit masses usually, but if you do, you, you do sometimes need to worry about this sort of accounting basically of, of, of rates, okay? But um, for most, everything we're doing in this class, it, it shouldn't be an issue. Okay, so then, uh, so you're, you're getting Boudreau rate tau. Now, the other thing we need to worry about is that tau is not a probability, okay? Tau is is this flow probability or you, a continuous rate, okay? Um, and so we need to well, we need to figure out what do we mean by that, okay? Uh, right. And so essentially, in in a in general sense, okay, tau is going to be a what's called a Poisson flow rate, okay? So that so uh, so it's going to be a Poisson process, okay? And uh, what that means is that uh, over some time period delta, which actually it can, I usually I refer I use delta as an infinitesimally small period, but it can be anything really. Uh, over some time period delta, the um, the number of times that this event, in this case innovation, occurs is delta times tau. Okay, so so uh, let's see. So so like the the let's let's say that x is the number of innovations. Then x Poisson is uh, distributed. Let me get okay. Yeah, and so yeah, if x is the number of innovations over this time period, then x is distributed with a Poisson distribution with mean parameter delta times tau. Okay, another another way I could write it actually maybe this is better is let's say that x is just the cumulative number of of occurrences and so then x of t plus delta minus x of t is Poisson distributed. That's probably the best way to say it. That's like slightly more formal. Okay, is that the 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 number of instances of this event uh, over that delta time period is Poisson distributed? Okay, so um, okay, so that that's a. Uh, this, I'm going to give you more information than you really need. What we're going to need is very simple. I'm going to give you kind of the background just because it's kind of cool. Um, so it's Poisson distributed. Now, what is Poisson? Well, uh, this is going to look like, uh, let's see. So, so in general, the density of a Poisson, so the probability that it takes on value X, okay, given some param uh, mean parameter mu, Okay, is let me see if I can get this right. E to the minus mu and x raised to the mu and x factorial. Let me just check in my notes. <clears throat> it's in the uh, in the slides. The, the question is whether the first term is, is flipped or not. Yeah. Come on, pass off. Mu to the x? No, nah, it's mu to the x. Okay, sorry. Screwed it up. So mu to the x, e to the minus mu over x factorial. Okay, so that, that's the definition of a Poisson distribution. Okay, All right. So this is, um, it's a discrete distribution. x takes on discrete values from 0 to 1 to 2 and so on for the natural numbers. Okay. Um, and mu, but mu is a continuous uh, number, okay? And so mu is, it's a one parameter distribution. Um, and you, you can calculate the, the probability for each x conditional on mu. Uh, and mu actually is the mean. So the, the, the expected value of x is in fact mu. Okay, so mu is, it's a parameter, but it's also that exactly tells you the mean one for one, okay? Not only that, it'll, it'll tell you the variance. And in fact, the variance is also equal to mu. It just so happens, okay? Um, all right, and so that's uh, sometimes, so it's people talk about under or over dispersion, uh, perhaps you, you something people were talking about it in the context of COVID, uh, the distribution of the number of um, people that get infected per uh, incidence of like contact or interaction between people, saying that it's over dispersed in the sense that um, 
there's like a small, most of the time it's zero, but then with a small probability, it's a very large number. Okay. So that's, that's sort of like some notion of over dispersion is that it's, things are out in the tails kind of. Um, and so here, when they say that stuff, they're, they're, they're usually, so, so that's an example where you can think about that variable being Poisson distributed. It's a discrete variable, right? You either infect someone or you don't, I mean, roughly speaking, um, like, yeah, that's not quite true, but like, let's say that it is a uh, discrete variable, you infect a certain number of people, it's a random outcome and so on and so on. Okay. So, uh, when people say over or under dispersed, they're usually using Poisson as the baseline in the sense that the Poisson has the same mean and variance. Okay. Whereas if you have more variant, if the mean, the variance is higher than the mean, that's over dispersed and under dispersed, it's the variance is less than the mean. Okay. So in the case of Poisson, it, it's exactly evenly dispersed in that sense. Okay. The ratio of the variance to the mean, uh, and other distributions like the negative binomial and stuff like that are, are generally going to be over dispersed. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's the thing. I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's, it's actually, I mean, it's useful in general. Um, I think to, to know about these, these statistical properties of the Poisson distribution. Okay. And then the other thing you can think about, you know, and this, this, this is a little bit more, if you're thinking about things at a, a micro level, right? If you think about the log of F of X given mu, well, it's going to be, you know, like when you're, when you're estimating a parameter like mu, let's say you were doing like a maximum likelihood thing to find mu. Okay. You, you don't really like, um, if you, so if you think about, Okay, if you think about the log of this thing, it's going to be uh, the log of mu to the x, which is x times log mu, minus log of mu. Okay, um, and then uh, minus log of x factorial. Okay, so now, but from from the perspective of estimating the uh, uh, value from mu okay you're gonna if you're doing maximum likelihood you know you're gonna take the derivative of that and set it to zero okay and so when you take the derivative right with respect to mu you're gonna get what you're gonna get x over mu minus one over mu wait let me think um That was not supposed to happen. Ah, this is the log of mu. Yeah, mm -hmm. this guy. This should just be mu. That's why, right? Okay. I was like, this is not. This argument is falling apart, and that's because that should be a mu. Thank you, uh, Joanne. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's x log mu minus mu minus x factorial. Okay, so first the x factorial doesn't matter because it's it's just a function of the data. If we if for for the purposes of maximum likelihood stuff that's linearly separable that's only data dependent and not parameter dependent will drop out in a derivative okay so here we're going to get minus one and then you know log of x factorial relatedly though if you do want to compute the log of x factorial in general it's somewhat difficult but there's this thing called sterling's, sterling's approximation which will say that that's approximately equal to x times log of x so just keep that in mind but we don't need to compute that so we're not going to use sterling's approximation um okay so this is going to be x over mu minus one, which actually, if, if you combine the fractions is X minus mu over mu. Okay. So that's, um, that's essentially the proportional difference, uh, between X and mu, right? So, so if you're thinking about, um, how to move mu around to make, to make some maximum likelihood, you're essentially trying to minimize the proportional error between mu and any of these X outcomes. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and if you do the same thing for a normal distribution, okay, you essentially get, you essentially get like, uh, you get x minus one basically. Do you think about taking the log of a normal, and then the derivative? So you get for, with the log, you get like a negative quadratic term or a quadratic term, and then when you take the derivative, you get like a linear term. Okay, or maybe, maybe I should put it like a over sigma. Okay, so um, with the with the normal distribution, you're minimizing the, the absolute difference. With the Poisson, you minimize the proportional difference. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so the so the Poisson is 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 kind of uh, reasonable, okay, uh, and it kind of arises from uh, in a lot of settings, okay. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other useful stuff about it. It's like uh, if you add two Poisson random variables together, 
the sum is Poisson with, with mean parameter, which is just the sum of the individual mean parameters, okay? And so so it's it's nice and linear, okay? It's uh, closed under addition and stuff like that. Okay, so very friendly distribution, I would say. Um, now, what we're gonna do is is actually ignore all of this cool stuff about it and, and just use a, an approximation for when it's positive, okay? So, um, yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna, because so, so the thing is, all we really care about is over a short time period, delta t, what's the probability that this thing happens at least once, all right? Because if I get innovated on twice, I, I, I'm just as out of luck as an incumbent as I want, as I was if I get innovated on it once. And, and over a short time period, a short enough time period, the probability of it happening twice is, is sort of delta squared level. And the probability of it happening, happening once is like delta level. Okay, so essentially it, it's not, we're gonna be looking at short time periods. And so it's only, it's either not gonna happen or it's gonna happen once. Okay, and, and anything uh, higher, anything more than that is higher order, uh, higher order powers of delta, which are negligible. Okay, so um, so we're, we're really gonna be interested in what's the probability that, you know, X is greater than zero, sorry, greater than zero given. Okay, which is, I'm just gonna kind of cram this in here because I have to go to the next page in a second, which is really just that uh, one minus the probability that X is zero, given mu, which is gonna be one minus what? Uh, well, that thing evaluated at zero, the, the first, the mu to the X term is gonna give you a one. You're gonna E to minus mu and then the X factorial, factorial at zero, is actually it's one okay so um that's going to be one so this is just going to be e to the minus mu okay so that that probability that it's greater than zero is just one minus e to the minus mu. so that's relatively simple okay so so let's let's use that okay so the probability uh that x is greater than zero given mu we just found is one and oh no where am I? Grand macro. You can you can see that my wife's handwriting is much better than mine. Lucky that you guys got stuck with me. Um, so uh, yeah, so the probability that x is greater than zero given mu is one minus e to the minus mu. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to write exp instead of e to the just because it's it's easier. Um, and then okay, so that's true for just some random Poisson distribution. Okay, with uh, with the uh, mean parameter mu. But remember our what we're actually going to look at is is a mean parameter delta times tau. Okay, so we're looking at you have a Poisson low rate tau. That means that the mean over some period delta is delta times tau. So mu is delta times tau, and so we're going to plug that. Okay, so so our probability that um, you know x is greater than zero given a, I guess I'll just write delta times tau, which is now mu, uh, is one minus e to the minus. Delta tau, okay. Um, all right, and so the last, and then the last thing we're going to do is say, okay, well, that's true, okay, and that's that's true for any delta, basically, okay. Uh, but we're really only interested in small delta at this point because we're gonna we're gonna write a value function and for for some delta, take delta to zero to come up with a continuous time form for it. Uh, so for small delta. Well, it's gonna it's 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 gonna be approximately equal to, to basically delta times tau. Okay, so if you take the derivative, if you take a Taylor expansion of this with respect to delta around delta equals zero, the the derivative you're basically gonna pop off a tau, okay, and then you're gonna multiply it by delta, which is the the variable itself. So you, this is gonna be approximately equal to, to delta times tau, okay. Um, if, if you want to, you know, what does this thing look like? You know, this this function looks like a thing that's uh, what's well, got slope delta times tau at the beginning, and then it's it levels off to one. Okay, but that slope at zero is going to be delta times tau. So this is this is as a function of I guess delta, right? Okay, so um, yeah, so that that's going to have slope delta times tau. All right, so that that's our Taylor expansion. Okay, um, and that's what we're going to use. Okay, so so at the end of the day, we did all the Poisson stuff. The old, really, it's just 
if the flow rate's tau, the probability over a small time period that the thing happens is delta times tau. Okay, that's it. All right. Uh, but the Poisson distribution is still cool. It's still useful for other, for uh, especially for maximum likelihood. If you're, if you're trying to match discrete data, the Poisson distribution is your is your friend. Okay. Um, all right. So let, let's do the value function. It's not so bad actually. Um, so uh, what's that going to look like? So we're going to take the same basic steps that we took before. Okay. We're going to say, what's the value at t? Okay. What's the value of t? Well, let's say today there's there's a, there's a little bit of a timing question, but let's say it's, if you start out today, um, you, you have some time period delta. Uh, let's say you get the profits for sure. Okay, maybe someone innovates, but they don't formally kick you out until the end of this small time period. It doesn't really matter how you do it, but let's say that that's the case. So you get the profits for sure. And let's just say it's, it's some pi of t function. We don't. It doesn't matter that it's actually what what it looks like pi. It's just the number pi. Uh, I mean, whatever pi is. Okay. So you get those profits. Maybe someone comes in and innovates with probability delta tau. And if they do that at the end, they'll say, okay, Doug, it's you had a good run. Okay, but we've we've out innovated you. It's we're gonna put you out the pasture. Okay. So um, maybe I'll be back. But so you know, for this product line, I'm done. All right. So. If that's the case, I will uh, I will have one last yeah though before I leave. Thank you very much. But if that's the case, then I I just get zero. Okay, so I'm out, right? In terms of profits. Okay, so I'll get I'll get zero. Forward looking, all right. Uh but maybe that's not the case. Maybe I'll live to produce another day, okay? In which case that's probability one minus delta. Okay, so here because we're in small delta land. We can say one minus delta tau and and know that that's for a small enough delta going to be a positive number. Okay, so now this delta tau really is now functioning like a probability. Okay, um, and I'm I'm risk neutral and so on. So I, I evaluate these things as as that uh, in a linear way. Um, and so uh, one minus delta tau, and in that case, I'm going to get. Um, okay, so here's well, yeah. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna write it. I get V of T plus Delta. Okay. But I also, I forgot about discounting. Okay. Let, let's just discount this whole thing. Okay. So th all this stuff is happening sort of at the end of the period. Okay. So we do also want to discount this rate, this at rate R. So I'm going to remember R is what the firm uses basically as it's uh it's discount rate. Okay. So but I should have put the kind of beginning. I mean, usually I would put it at the beginning. I just forgot, but it's the same, obviously, because of the uh, commutativity of multiplication, multiplication, or maybe it's associativity. I don't know. But uh, you know, you discount it in the future, and then you have this random outcome: delta tau. I get booted out. One minus delta tau. I continue producing, and I get the you know the next time step forward uh, value. Okay, so that's it. All right. Um, well, it's not it, but that's the first step, okay? Uh, and then it's just sort of like using kind of stuff that we know about approximations, okay? So, well, the first thing is, I mean, okay, we got we got delta pi. That's not going anywhere. Uh, the zero, obviously, is is going to disappear, okay? So what we're left with is what? Well, the, okay, so the, we have that exponential term. I'm going to move that back to the front, okay? Uh, you know, just, just like um, this, you know, uh, let's see, this here was approximately equal to delta tau. Just the exponential part is going to be approximately equal to one minus delta r. Okay, this this here. Hey, is, Henry, uh, yep. Oh, I I wonder why why is there delta tau probability of being zero value? Isn't because be... if if they innovate, if there's a new innovator, I think this is the value for the incumbent, right? So the new innovator comes oh, along, oh, oh, they okay. kick me so out. This is the value, okay. Yeah, and then I'm just done. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that exponential term that's going to be approximately equal to I, I should write approximate here. Uh, most of the stuff is going to be approximate at this point. It's going to be approximately equal. I mean, really, it's all approximate, right? So because for a small delta, right? So uh, it's going to be approximately equal to delta one minus delta r. Okay. And then on the inside we have well the zero is gone, and then we have one minus delta tau. And then we have V of T plus Delta. 
Okay, so that's uh, basically I, I I just uh, got rid of the zero because it's zero, and then I, I I added in that one minus delta r approximation. Okay, and then just kind of simplified a little bit, uh, and that's what we get. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> now okay, we're almost there, and the the only thing we need to do is uh, this is this is also technically I guess going to be approximate. Um, we can simplify the product of those delta terms. Okay, because think about you know, factoring that out, foiling it, if you will, uh, you're going to get one minus delta R minus delta tau plus delta squared tau R, right? But we don't care about delta squared, right? So that, that's that's going to be negligible for us. Uh, so so anytime you, there, there are sort of informal rules you can think about, right? Anytime you have like these two types of things multiplied together with, with like a one minus delta times something, it's really just going to turn into like one minus delta times the sum of those two things. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. So then uh, that, what's that going to look like? Well, it's going to look like one minus delta times R plus tau now. Okay. Times that V of T plus delta. Okay. So this is, this is really where we're almost done. Okay. We're almost ready to take that, that limit. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and, and that, that last step though, it's kind of related to another thing that will come up potentially. I mean, once you start doing some more sophisticated stuff with Poisson processes is, well, what if you have two Poisson processes? Okay. Running, like maybe you can get innovated. Um, um, you know, maybe there's radical and incremental innovation and, and your fate is differential depending on what, which one of those happens. And they each have separate rates. What's the probability of, how do they work out when you have two process processes running? Okay. Well, it turns out basically when you have this small Delta regime, the probability of them both happening in the same time period is, is going to be negligible. Just like the probability of one happening twice is negligible. It's the same kind of thing. Okay. So plus on processes don't happen at the same time for small Delta basically. Okay. And that that's the algebra will look very similar to what happened here. Okay, so you get like a delta squared term when you work out the, the cross probabilities. Okay, um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, but that's useful because it's annoying to, to say, okay, well, what if this happens, but the other one doesn't happen? What if the other one happens, but this doesn't? You know, it's a combinatorial issue, but in the limit, they don't happen at the same time. Okay, so so it's, it's a little easier. Okay, um, okay, so so this is what we have. And now it's just, this is this is almost exactly the same as what we did before okay is we need to well we need to rearrange things a little bit okay so we're gonna uh well let's see how should we do this um uh we can uh yeah so i guess we can add some stuff to the other side we let, let's move all the value function stuff to the left and just keep that profit on the right okay so what we're gonna get is delta plus times r plus tau dt plus delta. Okay, so I'm gonna I move that second part of this term here over to the left. And then I'm gonna um well let's let's keep that at the stuff on the right hand side. So I, I just move that over. Okay. This, okay. And then we're gonna have on the right hand side we still have this V of T plus delta from the one here. Okay. And then we're gonna subtract V of T. Okay. All right, that's step one, kind of rearrange stuff. And then we're gonna divide R plus tau, T plus delta. Oh, we're divided. Okay, pi of T, we're dividing by delta for the record. Uh, and then here we're gonna get a derivative looking thing. Okay. All right, so that's the penultimate step. And the, the, the final step is just take that, actually take the limit as delta goes to zero, in which case we get R plus tau, V, I'm gonna drop the T's now, uh, equals pi plus V dot, okay? Or if you wanna write it in what I, I like to think about it, sort of the canonical form, R plus tau V minus V dot equal to pi. Okay, so in the end, Really, all we did, we, we had that, we just added in tau, okay? And it turns out that tau looks a lot like a discount rate, okay? Because it's the it's the rate at which you're um, getting 
picked out. Okay, you're going zero profits. Okay, and um, it's very similar to if you have a uh, in, in a utility um, setting, if you have a discount rate, a pure rate of discount uh, row, and then you have some probability of death, say, then that's going to, that probability will just kind of, at the end, it'll end up looking like just a, a, an additional term of the discount rate. Okay. Or conversely, we had the, the population growth. Remember that looked like a, a, a negative term in the, the discount rate because it's sort of like the opposite of death, I guess, birth. Um, and so, you know, the, these things, because it's kind of the way that the exponentials work, they, they tend to look like discount rates. Okay. Um, all right. So that's it. Now uh, we can simplify this a little bit further in, in, the, in a way that should be familiar. You, you divide by B and you're going to get R plus tau minus B dot over V equal to pi. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, and then you can solve for uh, pi over v. Okay, and then you can solve for v, right? And get v is equal to pi over r plus tau minus what we'll call gv. Okay, so th this is similar to what we found before, just with that extra tau. Okay, so let's say that this is our final product. Okay. All right, so yeah, we're almost out of time here, but um, what you can see is, well, v is going to be proportional to pi, right? So whatever, you know, GV is going to be something. We don't know what it is yet, although it's actually going to be really simple. GV is going to be something, okay? Um, <clears throat> and, and it'll be something constant, hopefully, to be GP. So that, that whole denominator is going to be constant. So then V and pi should be growing at the same rate in, in, a, in an equilibrium, okay? Um, all right, and so... Uh, you know, in, in a, or sorry, in a steady state. So in a steady state, we should have, you know, GV equals G pi equals, remember G, G, well, remember pi is proportional to Y. So this is actually going to be G Y. And in a steady state, at least, that's going to be equal to G. Because, because remember Y is equal to Q times P, right? And if P is in steady state, then it's just Q that's growing. And Q, we're just calling growth of Q, we're just calling G. Okay, so so in this case, it turned out before we had all this stuff, the Euler equation, like it was it was it was annoying with finding GV. Here, it's just it's just G, right? So, um, this is in steady state, and it but it turns out out of steady state, it's it's also very simple, and it's going to actually be exactly the same. Okay, so uh, through the free entry condition. Okay, so um, yeah, so that that's. That's the roadmap. Okay, now I guess we're nearly out of time. The the French condition. What's with that? Okay, so uh, let's see. Let me. I, I put this in the slides. I think right. Um, yeah. So uh, let's see here. Uh, basically, the way we're gonna do this is. Let me just tell you what the, the production function for ideas is, and I'll tell you what the free entry condition is, and then I'll be out of time after that, but but you can then ponder on it. Um, essentially, the, the production function for ideas is going to tell us how does, like, basically, how do we get tau? Okay, how, how does innovation happen? Well, it's going to happen when people do research, okay? So, so if you put in a certain amount of research labor R, you just multiply that by gamma, so gamma is the individual probability of, of a... The researcher being successful, and that's going to lead to a total amount of innovation tau. Okay, so there's our, you know, you're putting in our researchers somehow. They each have a probability gamma of being successful, and when they're successful, they produce innovation. Uh, so that's what tau is. Okay, so so the production function of ideas, it really is just this. Okay, because because you don't produce Q directly, you produce innovations which increment Q, which which increment QIs, and then aggregate into a Q. Okay, so but before we, we produced n directly, essentially, but now we're doing innovation, which then maps into Q, slightly indirect, but but it's the same basic idea. Okay, um, all right. So this is your your production from for ideas. That's going to lead to a free entry condition. Okay, if you put in one additional work uh, research worker, they have a probability on the margin gamma of being successful. If you're successful, you get V. 
Okay, and we're going to equate that to W. Right, so you, you can either be a research worker and, and get that expected value gamma V, or you can be a production worker and get uh, for sure which W. You're risk neutral anyway, so you, you equate those. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's our free entry condition. Right? And what we're going to do then is okay, we know V, it's, it's right up there. We know pi. We know W even. W is Q over lambda. Right? So it's actually, the, it, it simplifies pretty quickly. All right. Um, I, I'm at the end of the class time. You, you can look at the, I'd look at the notes just, just to see how, how the story ends, but it simplifies much more, it's much more friendly than the other derivation. Things cancel nicely, and then you get basically an expression for, uh, for R, okay, which gives you an expression for tau, okay, and, and that'll give you an expression for V, okay. And, and I'll show you next time. It, it turns out that G is going to look like this. It's going to look like log of lambda times tau. Wait, so G is going to be some, it's a product of the innovation rate and how big those innovations are. It turns out that the exact way to write it is log of lambda times tau. Uh, and we can show that, but if, you know, tau is going to lead directly to G through some lambda factor, which gives you an idea of how big each innovation is. Okay, so you're going to get a growth rate at the end of the day too, from, from R to tau to G. Okay, so that's that's basically it. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I, I think uh, getting the growth, how, how to calculate the growth rate is, it's a little bit of a new thing for us um, in the sense of sort of getting these, finding uh, finding the growth rate of some random aggregator. You know, it, I don't think we've quite done that yet. Um, we have all the tools in place to do it, uh, but sometimes it can be tricky. Uh, so I'd, I'd look at that too. Okay, but I, we're like 90% of the way there. It, it's mostly just algebra after this. Okay, so... Um, so, so I think you should be in pretty good shape if you want to start the, the homework now, okay? Um, if In addition to looking through the slides, okay, the, at the end there, okay? Um, yeah, all right, but then, and I'll, I'll cover all the loose ends on Thursday and the social planner, okay?